Recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. I give you the heart of Golganuza. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 282 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. This week's show, we're going to have a club discussion, and we're on to issue number 10 for Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. Then we're going to jump into their weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth, and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old. We're going to talk about them there, and that will be the lineup for our show. So let's start with... The club discussion. We are on to issue number 10 of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. In the final issue of The Rise and Fall of Golganuza, which I assume is the story arc, uh, Maceo and Mezzi inflict emotional damage on each other in ways even the wasteland couldn't dream of. And I hit a button on my note sheet that went way out of whack, so let me find my place again. Um... And the threads of their relationship continue to tear. The community is dissolving and breaking, just like Maceo's machines, and he and Mezzi are poised to be the final remaining members. If it comes to that, can they salvage what's there, or will they even want to cross the chasm between them? This issue is done by Jason Aaron, Layla De Duca, Tamara Bonvillain, Nick Dragota, Rick Ren- Rico Renzi, and And World Design. Okay. So, uh, this issue's cover uh, says a lot. Um, seeing our characters uh, kind of at the, the cliff's edge here, kind of walking away, a little foreshadowing of what we're about to uh, experience. It does start off with kind of a new scenario of, uh, of a Christmas time, but this is taking place at day 43 for the birth of the engine. Uh, so, the whole kind of overview of this issue is... Uh, Maceo coming up with this engine, this uh, this powerful engine uh, designed to feed off the energy of the Earth itself. Um, it could power the entire city, he thinks, and one of the old cities with its billboard TVs and robot dust-sucking machines. So he's kind of talking about the power of what this uh, machine can do. Uh, but then it takes a drastic turn t- uh, from day 45 or 43 over to day 1299 as the majority of this issue exists in darkness as uh, Mace and Mezzi are basically on an adventure trying to find this this hidden monster that's out to get them, trying to find each other because they've been separated. And uh, what we kind of learned throughout this issue is that uh, we, we've seen, we've teased with it in the past of seeing how um, when they see each other, they kind of see this beast and this monster represented from the other person. So we have a lot more of that that explored in this issue, showing that uh, they even face off against each other, not knowing that they are who they are. They just think the other person is a beast. And there's some pretty uh, crazy moments in this book and pretty emotional ride, mostly pretty action-packed, very suspenseful, very horror-filled kind of pacing for this issue. Um, And eventually kind of... uh, revisiting once again the way future timeline that we got teased way back in that first issue so that is kind of the overall um idea from uh, issue number 10 let's kick it over to jim first if you want to let us know what your thoughts were on once upon a time at the end of the world number 10 i want to start with the cover again uh you talked about seeing them walk away from each other across the rift I want to go back down to below the rift where you see the faces and the tears pouring out of the faces. I never looked at it that close and I see it now. And it looks like Katie. Might um, and how <laughs> I think this is just, this is just such a great summary of, I think what's happening is how, when the pain is getting to the point where they can't deal with it, they're just walking away 
And I think that it even said it in the in the book, you know, this issue that uh, they had to work at it to um, keep the relationship, keep love going. And apparently there was something that stopped that from happening and they ended up losing that. And while they still loved each other, they just were able, they lost the relationship in the, while they were doing it, whether it's because they had too much involved in the rest of the community or in their own work. Um, they just, and I think uh, I'm going to turn, there is one image uh, where, and I can't find the page number off in my book, page 13, I believe, uh, where they've been looking for each other, they've been leaving each other messages, and finally they pass each other, and this picture just shows them kind of actually passing through each other. I know which one you're talking about here. And it says the words, the word balloon is all, it says almost, but not quite. Now, is this something that's happening to them or is this just a metaphor for the way they've been? And that's what I don't know yet. Is there something actually happening to them, like making a physical change in their bodies that is bringing this on, uh, that they see the beast in each other? rather than and are unable to actually see the real person yeah that's or, or is this just a psychological metaphor yeah it's an interesting thought because yeah for those that are unfamiliar they were both looking for each other and there's moments where they feel they kind of have a vibe where they're just like like you know it feels like their energy that they're here and then yeah we see that kind of pass through and and yeah that could uh it can go one of either ways. I think that's kind of a good thing you you brought up, and and the, I love seeing the the old people at the end and getting the a bite of what was promised very early on, and it leaves a little bit of story to wrap up after that again. So I think we've got another couple of issues that will explore that. So I had to find one of the pages. Maybe give us some full. I had to find one of the panels where uh, people were covered, so that was one of them. Yeah, <laughs> for some reason, yeah, um, uh, Maceo has given up on clothing altogether. <laughs> well, they're standing. Yeah, it looks pretty warm over there, so maybe uh, maybe he's onto something. All right, um, we'll jump over to Katie. Thoughts on issue number ten? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, this was the best book of this arc. Um, I felt like it was a very satisfying and natural conclusion. Um, I had interpreted it as like the gases or something had done something to them so that in addition to the psychological torment, I felt like there was something physiological going on. But I think you bring up a good point that is this just a metaphor? That's a really cool, creative way of seeing it. Thank you. Um, so for me, like the feelings I got while reading this were very much melancholy right? Like they, they did a good job with the horror, but then within there, there was loss, there's isolation. Um, and I thought that was a really good way to do it. And the end is kind of sad to, to see them going from, you know, being indifferent to each other, to being so obsessed with each other, to now actively hating one another. Um, that was very skillfully executed, but definitely hard to see our characters in that position when they're looking at each other over that like earthquake that opened up a chasm in the ground, I thought it was super poignant and moving. Yeah. And that we have a physical gap representing the emotional gap between them was pretty cool. I actually liked this one quite a bit. I know I've talked before that I didn't enjoy most of this arc. This one I thought was really good. Um, and we got the payoff of several uh, issues in this one and I thought that was well executed for me I'd I'd even be okay leaving the series here but I am excited to see what happens next and getting as Jim said that that little tidbit into what they had set up from the very beginning where you know people are missing body parts and sending monsters after each other and I want to, I'm interested about, okay, so this is like a small detail, but you know how Mace was leaving messages for Mezzi and vice versa. And Mezzi was leaving messages for Mace. So 
So Mezzi writes out this, like, I love you, keep fighting, don't give up. And Mace reads it as there is no such thing as love in the wasteland, which is from the Rangers. I kind of want to know, like, if there's something more going on with that. Like, are did the Rangers build this place? Does Mezzi end up becoming a Ranger again? I want to, I want to get some follow up on that. I thought that was really intriguing. Um, uh, yeah, that was the best one for me. Uh, what does everyone else think? Yeah, I, I think the thing that I liked the most was seeing, um, kind of going off of the messages that they kind of had, uh, uh, mm-hmm. opposite messages. Cause right away in that next page, uh, he's playing, you know, tapes loud enough to try to get her to hear mm-hmm. and basically, you know, him with these marry me messages and everything, mm-hmm. but she hears it as screams and horror and you just right. see how this, whatever this thing is that's affecting them is just kind of, you know, making them, you know, go apart as, as tragic yeah. as that is. I love the execution of that. And that leads into that walkthrough uh, panel that I thought was great, but seeing the interpretation of all like the what they were attacking and facing each other every time they kind of came across each other and saw each other in kind of monstrous forms like i just dug all of the action that was buried into this issue as well yeah. and, uh, um that's a great and, point uh, and then here's a shot of uh maceo's version there when uh when he's looking like a monster her her so mm-hmm. yeah i i just dug all of the battle and whatever this this gas and this world is making you know doing to them and then the splash page of both of them in monster form going after each other Mm -hmm. once again not knowing that one is the other person so so yeah when it came to that whole aspect of the issue i i dug that a lot um Mm -hmm. and yeah going back to what katie was talking about with them just kind of at that cliff and uh i think there was a line i don't know if they said that they were just sitting there for hours just in silence um i think that was uh when you know they're kind of yelling back and forth and just kind of mm-hmm. ultimately deciding that uh what had kind of happened and uh basically oh yeah here we go we stared at each other for hours i kept trying to find words that i knew didn't exist in the end there was only one thing i could do and uh and that jumps into the future stuff yeah. but then you just see yeah. them walking away from each other but mm-hmm. Yeah, real, real strong issue across every little plot thread that they were uh, touching upon in this one. So, yeah, agreed. The pacing um, is, I thought, very well executed. So, out of all the technical things, the pacing, I thought that was really good. Yeah, that's an awesome review. Good, good summary. Um, anything else that anybody wanted to say about this issue? Okay, then we will go ahead and move on. Um, uh, Kirby, I guess I know Anthony knows, but I didn't know if Katie and Jim knew that they did bump it up to twelve issues or f- to fifteen issues. Yeah, from twelve yeah, I now. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, oh, fifteen now. Thank wow. You. Okay. Yeah, I was just about to say we'll be talking about issue number eleven, and then yeah, we found out there'll be even a couple more. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm still on board for it, and uh, we'll see. Uh, you know if they up it from there, if they're just tricking us to talk about 100 issues of this on a podcast, because normally, you know, sometimes we'll do a story (laughs) arc or whatever, this or that, you know, we'll still touch base on it as we're reading individually, but, but yeah, they they might be watching this very podcast and uh, being like, Hey, let's bump it up a little so they can keep talking about (laughs) it. Um, But yeah. uh, So that is that upcoming issues. Uh, These ones are actually released at the moment. We have issues, three and four of marvel unleashed it's jeff the jeff first and the my little pony black white and blue uh so all of those issues are available so we'll do those in the upcoming episodes haven't been you know, purposely not stacking so many club uh picks all at once to kind of spread them out so but also that buys everybody time to go ahead and get them and making sure everybody uh who wants to talk about them shows up and then we uh coming out yet in uh I think this month, yeah, but Howard the Duck number one, and then the Twist the Might Before Christmas. Um, Both of those ones will be uh, one-shots included in the club discussion as well. But that is going to do it for this segment. Let's jump over to the Weekly Reviews. Welcome to the Weekly Reviews. The first one I have is uh, something a little um, 
it's very original to the world of fiction. Very uh, uh, not normal for me is consuming an audiobook. I think maybe once or twice we've had some audiobooks uh, in the weekly reviews. Uh, but this is something, it's more of an audio drama because there isn't a physical book that it's being adapted from. But I am talking about Slayers, a Buffyverse story. Yes. Now, this is where I would normally hold up, you know, the item I'm talking about. So while I read this here, I'm going to hold up. It's going to be hard to see against my black screen here, but um, an earbud because I listened to this through an earbud. So this is what I have to show for where this content came from here. Um, yeah. Original cast members from the beloved TV series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, reunite for an all-new adventure about connections that never die, even if you bury them. A decade has passed since the epic finale, uh, final battle that concluded Buffy the Vampire Slayer on television. The game-changing spell that gave power to all potential Slayers persists. With new Slayers constantly emerging, things are looking grim for the bad guys. Rebellious vampire Spike is working undercover in Los Angeles with his old pal Clem when he meets feisty rookie slayer Indira, who wants Spike to be her mentor. Stakes intens uh, intensify as uh, Cordelia Chase emerges from an alternate reality where she alone is the slayer and Buffy Summers doesn't exist. Cordelia enlists Spike's help with the classic big bad terrorizing her world, his ex, Drusilla. We also have Giles, Anya, Jonathan, and Tara, who also return, but through the years and the vastness of the multiverse, not everyone is who they used to be. Slayers, a Buffyverse story, is written and directed by Amber Benson and Christopher Golden and co-directed by Casey Wayland. Um, this was something that was uh, announced uh, maybe a month or two ago, and it was, the way it was announced it was like, you would normally hear this and be like, all right, next year we're going to get this thing. They waited to announce it so that we only had about a month to wait to actually get it, which was cool. So the anticipation just wasn't building and building. It means we got it right away. Um, I've never subscribed to Audible. Uh, this was the thing that finally got me to do it. There's been other things that interested me in the past, but I never pulled the trigger on it. But all it took was an original uh, Buffyverse story done by the original cast voices so nobody was recast in these voices here it was it was quite a trip to hear everybody like it's it's such a natural fit for these people to continue their roles um it doesn't uh negate anything that came in the tv show uh they're not rewriting history they're actually building upon it and it is ultimately a sequel to uh the television show taking place about a decade later um, the one new character, uh, the main new character, I should say, is Indira. She is voiced by uh, Leia DeLon, uh, De Leon Hayes. Leia De Leon Hayes. She is a brand new Slayer. She's been activated, and we meet her at the beginning of the story where she's tracking down Spike. And what's awesome is that we get more Clem. This is the one thing that uh, if you are unfamiliar with Clem, He's a character that only had eight episodes out of the 144 episodes of Buffy. Uh, very few lines all put together. And he is, I think, one of the biggest uh, like superheroes, the biggest um, player in this uh, Buffyverse story. He's definitely there for comedic punch. He kind of fills the role of uh, Xander in a way. Because uh, you don't have Xander, you don't have Willow, you don't have Buffy. Um, all of these, you know, these stories are taking place just with these handful of characters while those other characters are out there doing their own thing. But having Clem be part of the Scooby gang, you know, like officially and fully like this is uh, something that it just, I think that is the greatest gift that this Audible uh, original story has given us that uh, we never knew we wanted. Um, so we have Spike and Clem that are basically working in the underground and uh but as it's it's eight or nine episodes which is like i don't know it's like seven hours six or seven hours i think total um so i'm going to just kind of do a big setup here it's going to build off of what i just said for the synopsis i'm not going to get into spoilers for anybody that uh, wants to listen um but the big plot of this story is the fact that Cordelia Chase shows up now in our normal television universe. 
uh, that character had passed away. And in this version, we see her come from the multiverse. Now they've been playing with the multiverse in the comic books. Every other aspect of fiction has been doing a lot of multiverse stories going on. This one's no different in that sense, but this one does it in a very unique and interesting way by giving us characters that have once died and seeing bringing new life into them without once again erasing their past so charisma carpenter playing cordelia again but in this way that in the in this universe where she was the only slayer buffy doesn't exist there's not a whole world of slayers and she has to go to the this other universe to recruit people to help save hers uh drusilla is uh one of the main bad guys i'll just leave it at that um drusilla voiced by uh, juliet landau is probably my favorite part of the entire series for as far as the hearing her play that character so perfectly it just feels like no time has passed everybody does a great job you know james marsters is spike he's done a lot of uh, audio narrations and stuff like that so he's no stranger to this world um, but some of these people who are uh, you know playing in this world for the first time uh it, it's just it's so comforting to hear their voices again anthony stewart head uh returns as giles and he's you know someone who has put the whole watcher and slayer and demon fighting world behind him but of course they're going to need some help so it's fun how he gets roped into the story anya so emma caulfield is anya uh she uh, plays i'll say that she does multiple takes on the character that we know and it's great to see her range when she's uh, sometimes acting uh, with herself and against herself. So I'll just leave that as a tease. Um, Amber Benson, who is the co-writer and co-director and all that stuff, uh, she is the lifeblood of this entire story existing. She's the one that uh, rounded up this uh, all of her old uh, cast members, some which she, she has worked with, some that uh, she hasn't worked with, but she was... Uh, she said it where she basically had to go through her phone just being like, okay, whose number do I have that I can put into this story? And uh, she's no stranger to uh, creating fiction. She's had uh, written uh, the comic books with uh, Christopher Golden as well. He's a big uh, name in the Buffy uh, um, comic book and novel world. And uh, Amber Benson has wrote her own you know, witch novels and stuff unrelated to Buffy. Um, so this is her playing in a in a new world that she loves and it is so cool getting to visit with these characters again um, I'm, I'm staying away from a lot of story stuff because every time these characters pop up you really don't know where they are in the world or where they are in the multiverse and it's so fun to figure out you know what has happened in the last 10 years with these people and uh and yeah, it, it was a delight. Um, I hope there's more. I know there's a lot of positivity coming from it. A lot of Buffy fans really dug it. And I hope it does well for them because, uh, uh, and, and the other great thing is we see a lot of behind the scenes stuff. If you go to YouTube interviews and stuff like that, they all recorded in, you know, the same booth with each other. Mine is James Marsters for a little bit because he said he had a cold and he still wanted to act with the people, but didn't want to get them sick. So he was placed in his own little uh, patient zero cubicle, um, but because he still wanted to feed off that energy. So it was cool that in a world where all of these people could have just recorded this, you know, in their own home studio and never got to meet up and stuff, they all actually got to act in the same room together and, yeah, uh, it, it's quite the experience. If you love that Buffy, so you love happy. audiobooks. Uh, if you've never done audiobooks, this is definitely a great thing. It got me to finally do it, and now mm -hmm. I've of course added a couple extra things to my list. So <laughs> now that they got me roped uh -huh. in, but yeah, Slayers, a Buffyverse story, I think is excellent. And if you um, want more content from Buffy beyond the comics, then here's just another avenue to uh, visit. All right, I think I said everything I wanted to say on that. Oh, I should comment on, because I talked a lot about the original cast, but Indira, who is the new member, she is the young Slayer. She brought a lot of life into the story. Yeah. Um, the actress uh, has made a mistake of making a joke saying that she wasn't too familiar with Buffy because, well, she wasn't born when the show was uh, <laughs> was currently airing. And all oh. of the actors all of the oh, actors that are in their 40s 50s 60s you know we're all just like ouch like 
you weren't even born when our little show was airing. Uh, but she does a great job at being like the one huge new character that's thrown into this universe. A young Slayer who is just excited to jump in. She knows all of the, the lore. She knows about Buffy. She knows about everything and she's excited to jump in. But her whole t- the whole series is kind of a test on her to uh, prove herself. And, uh, and as well as Cordelia opening up to allowing others to uh, kind of that, that she's in charge of others because she doesn't have a world to slayer. So now that she, you know, immediately has someone brand new that she, you know, sort of has to teach along with uh, Spike helping out too. So uh, a lot of performances where these characters didn't get to act with each other in the TV show. Um, this is just an awesome entry into the Buffy verse. All right. Whenever there's anything Buffy, I end up over talking. So I've said everything I need to do. That was an awesome audible original Slayers of Buffy verse story. Kirby, what you got? Yeah, I still want to listen to that. But when I seen you post it as your pick to review, I'm like, did I miss out on a one shot or something? No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> All right. We got a fun one here. We got Cap Wolf and the Howling Commandos. Number one. glasses always forget them all right in the world we know captain america was temporarily transformed into a werewolf decades after he fought on the front lines of world war ii with nick fury and the howling commandos but in this world where shadows loom at the fringes of the battlefield things went a little different this is a great look at this that storyline we got Sergeant Rock, the Hulling Commandos, Dum Dum Duggan, and all, all them in here. And I like how they did this because they stuck with the Sergeant Rock comic feel because, like, the pages and stuff had that, like, browning to them, that yellowing to kind of give them that old school look. Uh, but while we're dealing with the Hulling Commandos and Sergeant Rock, they're fighting through the war and then they end up coming across a tank and they got they want to try and redirect the tank get it away from the village where the people are and while they're trying to do that they have a bunch of problems sergeant rockets caught in a bunch of rumble and basically buried underneath it and the tanks coming at him and captain america shows up and then basically does what he does takes over everything yeah is it is it Fury? Because Sergeant Rock, that's the DC character, correct? Or Sergeant Fury, I mean, yeah. Okay. I, yeah, just, wanted to, totally, yeah. just wanted to catch yeah. that ahead of time. Yeah, mixing that up. But yeah, Sergeant Fury. Make- uh, and then uh so Cap comes in, just does what he does, so gets Fury out, out from underneath the rubble, and then goes after the tank, tells everybody else to get out of there. And he'll take care of things. And, of course, they stand back, watch, see what's going on. And he does basically destroys the tank and then gets all the crewmen that are inside the tank together and allows the dum-dum and them to come in and basically arrest them, take take over and get the people out of there. But they get back to where they're operating on the injured soldiers and caps in there. And Fury basically says, well, another mission comes up that they have to take care of. And Cap wants to go about it himself, just go do his thing. And they're they're like, no, we need you to take a crew with you. And Fury's like, well, I want you to be in charge, take over. And Cap's like, um, I'm a one man gang. I don't I'm not good at doing that stuff, but they end up having to go on the mission together. And it's like Cap just right away, just goes jumping out of the plane while everybody else has their parachutes. He jumps out without his parachute ahead of everybody else. It's like, I'll meet you down there. And of course he lands in a big old, in a pond where everybody else just lands normally. And so like, <laughs> it just has to go off the rails, but they come across this, witch type character that's doing some juju with her bones and summoning some type of spell and 
when they get to where they need to be, she's working with the Nazis and all of a sudden they hear this howling and all of a sudden a bunch of werewolves just start jumping out of the woods and attack the team. Uh, they battle away, they deal with things, people get injured and Cap, Cap happens to get a slash across the chest by one of the werewolves while he's battling away. And I don't really show a great picture, but you see the claw marks going down over the star on his chest. So yeah, the wolves disappear and they're sitting after they battle away for a while yet, but then they run off knowing that Captain the Cap's gonna have to deal with something with the virus that's in his body now. And of course they're standing around and all of a sudden Cap starts to hulk out and of course he's gonna be Cap Wolf. He's gonna turn into a werewolf, as we know from the story headlines. But yeah, I, I really like this. I it was iffy Cap Cap is still that character that annoys me. I, I like the older Cap before the whole Avengers and everything came up and everybody has to fight between each other and be their own person and control everything. But I like the version of him where he was still yet trying to figure out his powers and everything. Just once he got his head above water and got got into the whole advertising of things for the whole uh, bonds, the war bonds and all that stuff just commercialized cap and of course everybody started hating them then and it's just i don't know but this that's the cap we get here but yeah it's kind of fun seeing what dumb dumb and all them do with cap throughout this storyline but yeah I, I liked it i'll be sticking up out with it i wasn't sure if i would or not but it's fun look back at world war ii <laughs> it's not a fun era but it's just i like this group of characters together mm -hmm. so. looks cool yeah i love any time when cap jumps out of the plane without a parachute uh <laughs> it was winter soldier when he did that very casually and then somebody on the plane was just like was he wearing a parachute and they're just like <laughs> no he doesn't do that so <laughs> yeah That's when funny. he where is this picture if i can find it here here's cap as he everybody else landed on the shores and he's walking out of the pond because that's where he ended up just diving in couldn't control his flight midair <laughs> yeah sounds about right all righty we are gonna jump over to katie what do you have for us today all right i am excited to share this it is called oh, ufology volume one by boom so last week we were going through the catalog and Kirby mentioned something called ufology. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And Anthony says, hey, do you know there's a volume one out? And I'm like, I think I have that on my stack. <laughs> so I read ufology volume one by James Tinian IV from Boom Comics. This was released in about 2016. Uh, James Tinian IV has exploded in popularity and success since then. Very happy for that. Um, and so he is getting another volume in this story. He's also uh has local origins in that he is from wisconsin which is where our story takes place so it takes place in a small wisconsin town and uh our two main characters are high schoolers becky and mal mal is short for malcolm and they both have some creepy life-changing encounters with a supernatural entity an entity that is not of our earth um and they end up you know you know how like in small towns like everyone kind of knows each other and like you're probably related and if you're in a high school you know and it's not that big you know people above and below you you know because they're in choir or jv or sports or whatnot anyway they end up bumping into each other in school because they're in the same class and then they find out that they both have a connection to the supernatural so becky um encounters this entity and she ends up with like this spiral kind of tattoo or mark on her face and she keeps having these really weird dreams of these uh creatures 
they, they one thing i want to praise is they don't look like typical aliens so i appreciate that she's having these creatures and they're sending messages to her they're like where's our briefcase we're looking for our briefcase right and she is having more and more incidents of these dreams blending into reality and it's really spooky and she's quite shaken up by it now mal we find out he's actually a second generation experiencer because his parents are you know like they used to when they were young and dumb they were stoner hippies that were out looking for aliens because they thought it was cool and you know they were they always hoped they'd find something but they never really expected that that would until they did and then everything went wrong from there <laughs> so now back in our present day the kids are you know tracking down leads to find this missing briefcase as the aliens are referring it to they go to this really spooky um kind of like mix between a junkyard and a sculpture garden and they're messing around and then all of a sudden this alien like knocks down the door of the shed and was like you know i didn't want to have to do this but you left me no choice you know very ominous villain type stuff um and we see in a couple kind of side scenes that there's other entities what running around uh, the wisconsin countryside in winter causing havoc and that they're all connected somehow and thankfully the kids end up getting rescued um but i almost called her messy <laughs> becky is still having these weird dreams and now they're getting really out there where she's getting these like psychedelic landscapes and stuff and all of a sudden bodies are turning up at the morgue and the cops are like you know this is really weird what's going on here so um uh mal's father and one of his buddies are getting called in because they're like well this is you know like what happened 10 years ago you remember and Mal's dad wants, oh, I'm going to, so my background ends up eating it. This is what, what some of the world looks like. It's very colorful when she's talking to the aliens. We're finding out anyway, all of these encounters are very similar to what happened 10 years ago. And that is going to happen again. And that this has been a long-term thing. So at the end, we have a big climactic showdown. Um, there was a heel turn that actually surprised me that I thought was pretty well executed where a good guy ends up, you know, doing a bad thing. And we get to finally hear the true story of what happened 10 years ago when they did actually find an alien craft. And one of the members of their party went missing. So Mal's mom has been missing and the dad has was like, hey, she was taken by the aliens. She was on a spacecraft. But we end up finding out that that's not true that might have been the best of you know what he knew and understood but she's actually been recruited to do something much deeper and scarier um we end up having kind of a final denouement moment where becky's consciousness is projected onto the spacecraft and you know they're they're basically saying like you know hey goodbye thank you for helping us and while it's disconcerting i wouldn't say it's even that scary um and then at the very end, we get to see them out in the middle of the desert, some Area 51 looking area. And we got some uh, alien robot arms coming up from the ground. So something that I thought was good about this is this basically did tell a complete story. It's been, you know, some time so this, since this has been out. So if you're waiting for a sequel, you'll still get a complete story from this book. Um, I appreciated that they wanted to tell a unique alien story at least compared to, you know, a lot of the same themes that we see brought up in alien folklore and our pop culture around that. Um, and like I said, I thought the design of the aliens as being like these like, almost like people like made of like melting wax or putty versus like a gray big headed alien or a Star Wars alien. I thought that was really creative. Um, I appreciate that <laughs> uh, James Tinney and the fourth paints wisconsinites and especially small rural wisconsinites as more than just dumb hicks because excuse me i am an educated hick okay um but i appreciated that we were we were treated with respect and that you can tell an interesting story with elements of horror and wonder um in a setting that is a little different than what a lot of people will expect um so og listeners uh, if you think a long time back, I reviewed X-Files comics like in 2017 and 18. So I definitely enjoy the folklore aspect around alien stories and UFO stories and the implications of what that could mean for why are we telling those stories scientifically? I'll be honest. I don't know. I don't have a lot of information. It's something that's very hard to measure. 
But something that I did find in research is that sometimes people who have paranormal or supernatural experiences, they then have them throughout the rest of their life. It's kind of called the hitchhiker effect, the idea that you have a seminal experience and something continues to contact you or follows you that's hitchhiking and that even can run in families. Now, scientifically, I don't know if that is true or not, but the people who have reported those experiences believe that something has happened to them. It has had a profound effect on them, whether it's you know something in their head or something otherworldly, it's had an effect on them. And they do believe that what they experienced has been real. So I thought that was kind of interesting to carry in here as well. Um, and a great way to show a sense of time. It would seem that James Tinney in the fourth um, also does seem to really enjoy UFO stories and UFO lore because he's also working on the Project Blue Book comic over at Dark Horse. So he knows his stuff. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge expert on his books, but everything that I've read by him has been very good. I know generally he's really well received. I was quite happy with this. I would definitely read more from Ufology, Volume 1 by Boom Comics. Check it out. Cool, cool. Yeah, I sort of have that hitchhiker uh, thing too, but it's okay. when I would watch the Ninja Turtles and they'd eat pizza and then I started eating pizza. And now every year since I've been alive, like it's just sometimes a couple times a week, yeah. pizza, pizza, pizza. So. I, yeah, you're right. You know what? That's, that's a very great point. Did you at one point want to start learning martial arts too so you could be a ninja? You know, that part I didn't follow through on. I'm still waiting. Mm. You know. Gotcha, gotcha. All righty, uh, jumping over to my next one here, um, Midnight Show, issue number one. From the creators of The Six Gun and Manor Black comes this new supernatural horror series about monsters of the silver screen coming to life and wreaking havoc on a small town. Basil Saxon is a legend among horror fans. Over 50 years ago, he vanished during a freak accident on the set of a film that would have been his masterpiece. The cursed film, God of Monsters, was never completed and has never been seen. But when a film festival shows footage from the long-lost movie, classic horror monsters manifest to wreak havoc and terror on the unsuspecting populace. Uh, a ragtag group of misfits must band together to stop the most famous creatures of all time and send them back to the realm of the celluloid nightmares. This is done by Colin Bunn, Brian Hurt, Bill Crabtree, and Jim Campbell. Uh, hopefully I said all those names right because my autocorrect put it uh, Colin Bunn, but I knew it was Colin Bunn. So. But yeah, uh, the other names are correct there. Okay. Midnight Show, I think it's a four-issue miniseries from Dark Horse. I've got two issues. I've read one of them so far. Um, I saw the creature on the uh, cover here and an interpretation of the creature along with some other recognizable uh, classic Universal-type monsters. Uh, this was a really fun story. I think if you're a fan of the Scream franchise, of how it can get very meta and you got like horror fans that are excited to see horror movies and while they're also existing in a world where horror happens to them and their family and their friends you sort of have that vibe at least with this first issue here um it does kick off though as we kind of go back in time as we see um kind of an opening scene and we got two people that are kind of fleeing dracula's castle and it gives me vibes of uh the very first episode of buffy the vampire slayer where it's kind of a misdirect where you have, you know, the girl and the guy. And then you think like, well, the guy's acting kind of weird. He's probably going to turn around and kill the girl and he's the monster. And then we find out that the girl's the monster. And uh, it, it's always the kind of the fun misdirect kind of taking horror tropes and just kind of twisting it. And you sort of kind of have that when you kick it off here. But what you find out is that they're just on a movie set. So this is going back decades ago when they're filming this movie. Eventually, it's going to be called God of Monsters. But as the synopsis mentioned, there is a freak accident on the set as uh, fires, uh, flames take off. And uh, as you see the director chair on fire with nobody in it, um, this director has uh, vanished. Nobody knows where he is. And he was basically left for dead in this freak accident. But we cut to present time as there's this uh, uh, Basil Saxon Film Festival because they are going to show 
the uncovered, never before seen scenes from this movie that he never got to finish, this freak accident type of movie. So you got the you, this book actually follows a lot of different characters where you have uh, characters that are in the seats ready to see this one. There's a guy who had dragged his girlfriend there and she absolutely has no appetite for horror, no interest in horror, I should say. Um, you could tell that she's pretty annoyed every time that he's like talking about horror facts and things like that. And uh, there's this old uh, horror movie host that gets uh, you know brought out in a wheelchair that he's there to kind of introduce the film. And there's just a lot of lore leading into this fictional director and movies and stuff. Um, you also have uh, characters, uh, employees of the uh, theater that are in the lobby. They're just hanging out. You got two people just chilling. One guy apparently was a star football player who got an injury, and now he's just kind of really kind of down, down on his luck and bored. And he's working at the movie theater. Has really no, you know, football was his life. What, what's kind of interesting is that you just keep meeting all of these new characters, and this issue one dips back and forth between our reality and scenes from the movie, and so it kind of goes back and forth. You really do got to pay attention. I thought maybe if there was like a black and white presentation of the movie, um, that would have been like a, a real easy distinction. Um, but I think part of the storytelling is the idea that, as the synopsis says, is that uh, these monsters basically manifest into the world. So there's probably a creative reason why, you know, keeping the styles here. Here's a good example of it where you see like the orange and gold and yellow ones. This is just scenes from a movie. And then you cut to, you know, these random kids that are, you know, just walking about and looking for a party and stuff. But so as you do a lot of scene jumping from panel to panel, that probably plays into it as a fact that these monsters, and I'll start showing off some of this stuff as, you know, you got some uh, mummy characters jumping into the supermarket area. Uh, we see some Dracula, we got some people out there fishing, so I'll show the creature jumping out and attacking a, a fisherman, and so you're you're following a lot of people in a very short amount of time, but I think it does a good job of of showing how quickly this monster world of, from the movies is uh, um, invading the, uh, the real life world. Um, but yeah, this was a lot of fun, this is really cool. If you're a fan of Universal Monsters and such, this is a fun take. Um, like I said, if you're a fan of the Scream franchise, I get a lot of vibes of that, of just kind of almost the meta-ness of it. You know, I don't think it's as meta as the Scream franchise where they just do all these purposeful gags and things like that. But it, it has has some um, kind of hints of that kind of kind of storytelling. But yeah, I think this is a four-issue mini. I got a second issue waiting for me to read, but... Uh, yeah, this was this was a lot of fun. I uh, I know Cullen Bunn as a writer, and not uh, familiar with some of the other names here, but it really was seeing uh, one of the covers here. Um, and once I saw the creature on the cover, I'm like, okay, now they got me. So, but yeah, I highly re recommend this. And if it is a four issue mini, it uh, might be a good uh, trade weight as well. So, that is a Midnight Show uh, from Dark Horse Comics issue number one. All right, uh, Kirby. I got Hack Slash Back to School. This is done by Zoe, Zoe Thorogood, who did It's Lonely at the Center of the Earth, which I'm going to have to pick that up and check out. I really like what she did with this. It kind of takes us back in time to the beginning of Hack Slash, where Casey and Vlad kind of, it seems like it's, if you've never read anything hack slash before you can jump in right here and have a whole brand new storyline done by zoe thoroughgood uh, of course tim seeley and uh stefano Cas caselli were the originators that created hack slash but uh it takes you back it i think it's like right after the first time her and vlad meet up and deal with an entity and they're kicking back at a diner, just, and they show, well, first off, I suppose I should, they show this thing, this storyline going on where these kids are killing like their parents and 
just going off doing these weird things like here you got a girl that has a bucket of her parents or i don't know if that's yeah that's her parents uh intestines and she's using the blood to draw some nice little pictures that a normal kid would take crayons and piece of paper and draw on <laughs> just drawing yeah. flowers and drawing her family on the wall of the dining room <laughs> but, but then uh while they're talking about this and there's a news thing going on there's a family at a diner and they're like well could you turn this off because it's scaring our kids and they're sitting there and you got this character that's their waiter that's all and you got the tv in the background here the waiter's uh, dressed up in this bunny outfit <laughs> it's like yeah, I'll take Absolutely care of it. I'll, not. <laughs> I'll turn it down for you and turn it off. And you got Cassie and Vlad just sitting there eating away. And Cassie doesn't get much of her food because Vlad's constantly asking if he can have her fries or sandwich, all that stuff. But uh, we learn more about Cassie's mom and what happened where she had to take out her mom because her mom kind of zombied out one day and attacked her. And the stories are just going on and on about things from the past and what they're dealing with now and what's up with all these kids and all of a sudden our rabbit character as the kids are eating the ones that were disturbed by the tv and stuff he just all of a sudden whips out a machete and decapitates them <laughs> at the table <laughs> so, oh so. Okay, he went from being unsettling to just straight up murderous. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, we kind of get some weird visionary through this, and then we see other characters being taken out and stuff, and it's all done by the rabbit. But while this is happening, you're also getting little flashbacks throughout this. But then. Casey sees the rabbit and the rabbit kind of is half her mother and half a rabbit so she's kind of like tripping on this whole thing and before they end up taking out the character and dealing with it and someone just so just happens to show up and help Casey well Vlad at the whole at this whole time while everything's going on he's off in the bathroom so he doesn't even know that anything's happening and Casey's kind of still in the shy mode about the whole horror aspect and what's going on. So she's hiding underneath her table after the rabbit gets taken down. And all of a sudden, this older lady shows up with a patch on her eye and she pretty much puts her foot through the rabbit's skull. Uh, and we learn that she basically runs a school for girls that it's basically hunters for hire and darla ritz's academy for girls and she lets uh casey know about that and casey's interested and she's like i got nothing else to do i'm basically job searching at the moment anyways so the lady's like well you're welcome to come to our school and join up see how it goes see if you like it and she's like, well, and then Vlad comes out of the bathroom. She's like, well, can he come along? And she's like, yeah, he's welcome. As long as the rest of the girls are fine with him, that's fine. If not, then he's going to have to go or whatever. So we'll find out down the road more about that situation. But they come to the school and go in and get set, settled up, meet some of the girls. And, and it's I'm really hoping that this is a whole new hack slash storyline basis that's going to go on here, because if it is, we got a great group of fun girls inside here. And as they walk in the front door, they just so happen to be dealing with a giant Cthulhu type thing that's in the main room of the school. And we got a girl that has a pug that her pug died and now it's kind of it's got like it's zombified and it's got like a computer inside its brain or something because its eyes turn to ones and zeros and all this stuff and does all kinds of weird things 
we got a girl that's like the head girl of one of the three floors and she's got a cat that that's her familiar that i'm curious what's up with that uh we got this other girl that's just got she collects these weird japanese style bunny stuffed bunny type characters but she's also got one of her boyfriend's skulls with knives in it <laughs> in her bedroom as a collectible item and that's and this is my third boyfriend's skull <laughs> so, but all these girls just have really fun unique identities one looks like she used to be a slasher in slasher films one she's running around with a ninja sword and she's kind of got a little attitude yet she's a loner kind of goth goth girlish uh but yeah or try they're trying to figure out more about these kids and in the school it's kind of like xavier's school but for slasher then I mean, they even got like a main chamber room that the lady uses with all her computers and everything to keep up on any weird news stories out there that they can come across and they got they're on this kid's case they're seeing kids with these weird eyes and stuff like they're possessed in some way shape or form so it's it's gonna be a fun story down the line i assume and i i'm really enjoy what zoe did with this and i hope she, that tim and them let her just go with this storyline and we get to see stories for each of the different girls and their familiars and well not really familiars because they're not witches but they're their side character it's like there's a variety of different ones you see in the background that i'm just curious who who they're going to be associated with and what their special abilities are but I and mean, they they put uh vlad in a separate little cabin and so far some of the girls are iffy with him and stuff but i think he'll fit right in and the thing i love the most is vlad comes into the school and sees the girls and he's like uniforms do i get a uniform <laughs> he wants his own matching school girl uniform so i'm hoping they get him one <laughs> But if you know Vlad at all, he's just got that childhood mentality and just a really fun character. But yeah, it's, she did an awesome job. I was really surprised. I wasn't even thinking when I seen her name on and stuff that this was going to be done under just her. I assume that Tim had a hand still in it and stuff. But yeah, wherever it's going, I'm following. That's by Image Comics. Cool. Alrighty, uh, the next one I have here, Josie and the Pussycats, the Anniversary Spectacular. Josie and the Pussycats are about to put on a concert of a lifetime in space. Then, celebrate 60 years of Josie McCoy with some iconic classic stories. Uh, there's a lot of stories in here, so here is a list of all the creators that put this uh, together. Holly G, Frank Doyle, Tom DeFalco, Dan DiCarlo, Kennedy Brothers, Jim Amash, Rudy LaPic, Jack Morelli, Bill Yoshida, Vincent DiCarlo, and Glenn Whitmore. All right. With these uh, single-issue one-shots that uh, Archie does, uh, they usually lead with a brand-new story and then collect old stories in there. And this is no different. Uh, the opening story is Josie and the Pussycats in Rock Cats. Um, so basically we find out that they're on a mission that's being funded, uh, by all the rich people, um, with the, uh, the people that are from, uh, the Cabots that are from, uh, Josie's world, as well as Hiram Lodge, basically all, uh, coming together and they have this, um, uh, this, uh, pussycat rocket that's being shot up into space and that Josie and the gang are going to be performing a rock concert in space. Um, you see uh, Betty and Veronica, you've got Reggie and Archie and uh, uh, Jughead, all these people are, uh, you know, celebrating this occasion. But what made this story cool, um, if your eye didn't wander, uh, you would have been surprised to see uh, Cosmo, uh, the Archie uh, Comics Martian character. And uh, so he gets roped into the story as well, because uh, as they go into space, um, 
there happens to be a communication problem from space down to earth because there are these uh i want to show a non-spoiler image these are short stories here so i don't want to give everything away here here's a good image so cosmo um uh, notices on the ship of or the rocket of the pussycats there's these little uh little alien goblins that are basically uh, eaten away at the ship and that's where uh oh they're called blips these little blips and uh so yeah that's where cosmo jumps in and while they're on earth they're kind of wondering hey we lost communication with josie what's going on uh so you kind of see how the uh, everybody on the ground reacts to that Short stories, but a lot of fun, and it took a lot of characters and put them into one story. Um, these collect a bunch of old stories across 60 years that Josie's been around. Uh, Josie has had many uh, stories by herself. She's had many transformations and genres. Um, Mike Pellerito, who is the current uh, you know, publisher, editor-in-chief of, um, of Archie Comics, um, he uh, talks about just how how the journey Josie is the journey Josie has taken over the decades of of her book and the style of book and how it kind of keeps evolving and eventually down the line uh, becoming a rock star and adding the pussycat. So that wasn't always part of her deal. Uh, you have a story where basically they're commenting on the physical fitness program. Um, so I'm guessing at the time of this release with the presidential fitness and all that stuff that was going on. Um, so this story is commenting on that. And you see uh, how everybody reacts to uh, trying to get in shape. So it's a little bit of, uh, you, know, um, you know, it's good old Archie storytelling while trying to send a good mes message as well. Another story, which I really liked, uh, this one is by Tom DeFalco and the, um, they call them the, the Fab K Bros, uh, the Kennedy brothers. Uh, but this is a story where Pepper, one of the side characters, is deciding that uh, Melody needs to be, Melody of the Pussycats, needs to be more independent. That she relies on guys too much to do everything for her. To the point where she basically has all the guys wrapped around her finger. Um, so if she, basically when they're going to go camping, Pepper's going to take Melody camping. So even then there's like a bunch of like local school guys or something that are all just like packing the car up with all of her supplies. So even on a mission to get Melody to be more independent, there's <laughs> all these guys that tag along that are uh, just like carrying all of her luggage and stuff to go camping. So there's a lot of good comedy in this opening, uh, in the opening of this story. Um, but yeah, then you just see that uh, you go through a bunch of different, uh, you know, making a fire and going fishing, getting your food, all of the stuff that you would do when you go and rough it and camp and everything. It's uh, funny when you just see these guys that are just following the entire time. But while all this was fine and good, it uh, there's one more story in here that got me to bring this to the club this week. Uh, there is an old story here called Josie. Um, hold on here. Uh, Josie is the ghostly guardian. So it starts up and uh, has a very old fashioned feel, kind of what uh, Kirby was probably talking about with the Cap Wolf stuff and the Sergeant Fury and just the kind of, you know, the makes it look like you're reading old comics. And this is, you know, a reprint from a older comic, but it's a drastic change because everything's so co colorful and the, you just look on that one and then you just see like, whoa, you're jumping into like a, a pirate horror story. Now, this is an avenue I wasn't that familiar with, and Mike Pellerito at the end kind of talked about how Josie did have a handful of issues where she was dealing with these almost like Scooby-Doo type adventures, and I need to do some research and see if I can try to pick up these single issues or if they put them in a volume, but it is basically, uh, I think it's the Cabots again, um, have uh, acquired this kind of old castle type house place so then all the kids are going there to stay and they're finding some creepy things and they're just kind of going around find old like treasure chests and things like that and finding secret passages which kind of lead them into caverns so the story goes into some caverns and you just see a lot of creepy stuff going on um once again if you gotta check this out or want to check it out i'm not gonna give things away here but this was a whole facet of Josie that I don't think I was aware of uh, like I said gives it very heavy Scooby-Doo vibes minus 
you know, a dog. There's no animal that's, uh, you know, following them around. But it does really leave kind of like a true kind of scary horror type tale. You know, Archie has dipped into those kind of stories. And most of the time, more often than not, it ends up being like, oh, no, it was in their imagination or it was a dream or they were mis misinterpreting what they were seeing. But this one really did kind of leave that, you know, there were actual horrors going on. And obviously with Archie Comics and the, you know, uh, Sabrina being part of their world and stuff, she has nothing to do with the story. But obviously they've definitely not shied away from having those kind of stories. But that was the one thing that really, uh, um, really got me to, uh, once again, bring this up. And uh, I just want to see here, as the comic got into 40 issues of the original Josie run, um a lot of changes were happening uh we met alan m for mayberry uh josie issue number 42 the blonde sometimes boyfriend of josie in issue 43 of josie the introduction of alexandra cabot's cat sebastian was revealed to be the reincarnation of, of a cabot ancestor with connections to magic and that kind of just leads into all these other kind of things so yeah they lead into the supernatural which you wouldn't normally uh, think when reading some Josie comics but I think this is a good sampling over the decades of seeing what these characters are like and uh, yeah it's fun to celebrate 60 years of Josie McCoy but this issue got me to now have to dig into research to find some of these older creepier versions of her stories so yeah that was Josie and the Pussycats anniversary spectacular one shot all right we've got one more title on the list here Kirby what you got yeah, when you're showing off the Josie and the Pussycats, when you're talking about Cosmo and stuff for a second there, I was thinking from uh, Flintstones and Jetsons, because one of the spaceships you showed looked like a Jetson uh, it, flying ship. <laughs> actually, I would like to do the research on that to see what came first, because I talked about it with, actually, very conveniently, I have it here. Uh, I talked about the Jetta comics that Dan DiCarlo, you know, longtime Archie's, you know, created Josie and Sabrina and everybody, um, that when I read this, it was very Jetson vibes, but I would find out that these comics came 10 years before the Jetsons came out. So now I'm curious. So Cosmo, the Mary Martian is his full name. Um, I'm curious to see the, what's, what's the Flintstones Martian's name? I'm trying to think. I thought it was Cosmo Cosmos too, or something like that. He's a little green, green guy. Yep. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, with the little antennas coming out of his head, and I'll do some fact he check. I'll disappears fact and pops up and messes with Fred and Barney. I'll do some <laughs> fact checking for the end of the show. <laughs> All right, we got Marvel Zombies Black, White, and Blood. Again, these are wonderful runs. If you want to get your hands on, you don't need to know. Them. I don't think any of them that you need to know anything about the original storylines, and this does a great job too, taking us in the middle back to the beginning and towards the end of all the marvel zombie stuff just bounces you around with three different stories we start out with undefeated by garth enos and rachel stott this is a story basically of like this clan of cage fighters they got a cage set up and they have a zombified daredevil that they bring out and he battles whatever zombies they put in the ring and then they, at the end of the day, every day, they toss them down in this pit full of dead bodies or whatever. And it's got bones and skulls and all this laying down in there. He's just picking at whatever and eating. And in this story, he gets a visit from the Punisher and he gives him some little things to help him along the way with his future battles. I don't want to ruin the ends of these stories. They're all short stories, but it's fun seeing those characters popping up together and just how they cross all these different Marvel characters throughout these different stories. Our second story is called Hope by Alex Segura and Jave Fernandez. And in this storyline, we have Spidey at the Daily Bugle protecting J. J, J Jonah Jameson and a few of the other workers there that are still human while they're being attacked by tons of zombies and we're getting to see like 
Jonah's secretary, which was one of Peter's first loves back in the day. She's zombified and attacks him. Uh, we get Jimmy, zombified Jimmy attacking him and stuff. And it's just, it's, it's fun seeing all the different characters pop up. And he, at, while he's dealing with all this and trying to protect them, he's wondering what's up with May and uh, Mary Jane, if they're okay yet, if they're not zombified or not. But yet, and all of a sudden, we do get a zombified May that, Aunt May that pops up and she's going after spider-man like what did you do with my peter my innocent little peter <laughs> a, he's such a nice boy and what did you do to him so she's battling away with spider-man in this storyline and it's it's just it all works flows wonderfully with the whole marvel zombie stories and then our last one is called deliverance by Ashley Allen and Justin Mason. And in this story, we get Moon Knight and Kanchu sitting there like, why are we even wasting our time in this world anymore? It's basically done. Let's get out of here. He's trying to get Moon Knight to just quit battling against the zombies, quit trying for hope and all that. This is a black and white story. And it, it's interesting how they deal with their their normal back and forth banter, and then Iron Man Tony Stark shows up. He's zombified, and he attacks them. Well, he just so happens to have his sidekick, which is Anubis. He picked up. For his little spirit guide so he's trying to get tony stark to basically wipe out everybody and just finish it off while moon knight's guide is trying to get him out of there and all this and it turns into a big old battle between them all and it ends up a very interesting end to that story <laughs> but but yeah, these are very well done, as always, with black, white, blue, black, white, red, black, white, blood, black, white, gold, whatever you find, different characters that you got. They all, almost all have them, as you know, in one of our future episodes, we'll be doing My Little Pony, black, white, and blue, which I just got in the mail. So it's like, yeah, these are a blast. So check them out if they have any of your characters that you enjoy. I don't think you will be disappointed at all. So. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I did some fact check, and once I saw the name, I'm like, of course, uh, The Great Kazoo. Is that who we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yep. But yep. Uh, <laughs> he originated in 1965, and even though appearance-wise, you know, there's not too much uh, similarity, but Cosmo the Merry Martian was 1958. Um, but I'm not sure when Cosmo started to uh, show up within like Archie Comics mix, you know, because Great Kazoo didn't fit in with, you know, Flintstone era. Yeah. You know, that's So that might, that's probably original to them, but I, now I'm curious to see when Kazoo had it, or uh, Cosmo started to kind of branch off into other Archie books, but <laughs> but yeah, the Great Kazoo, I'm like, of course that was that. Yeah. <laughs> I should have had that name. <laughs> All right, well that is going to do it for our episode here. Some quick plugs. CrimsonCowl.com for info and original web comics. Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube. If you're listening to us audio only, go over to YouTube and see the video version there. Uh, subscribe, like, and all that fun stuff. The Crimson Cowl, all one word on Instagram. Crimson Cowl Comic Club on iTunes. Subscribe, rate, and review. If you want to email us questions or concerns or future fun letters page questions that we can all answer, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at yahoo.com. Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Uh, what would you like to let the people know on what's been going on or what's coming up with Under the Cowl of MS? Just got a variety of episodes finally out, some more comic reviews and stuff going on, and just doing the regular, trying to get more and more things out there for you. Cool, cool, cool. So yes, uh, subscribe to Under the Call of MS wherever you get your audio podcast as well as YouTube. 
Um, I have some artist accounts on Instagram and Facebook at Anthony Latch. That's L A A. T-S-C-H, and then I am a host of Cartoonist by Night, a drawing show, and uh, we recently released an episode with our friend D. Brad Gibson from the Oh Yeah Comics Fandom Universe uh, in an episode where we all hang out and talk and draw cartoon ducks, and I gotta say, it is our most successful episode to date. It blew past all of the other episode views. Uh, D. Brad is a big champion in that, but also Cartoonist by Night has an ad in the latest Santo Sisters Halloween special, which is being shipped to me at the right. moment. And we did get somebody that had uh, saw our ad in the issue and uh, watched the Franco episode and commented. Yes. So, so that works. So we're wondering, all right, is it Cartoon Ducks? Is it D. Brad Gibson? Is it an ad in a comic book? Maybe it's a combination of all three, but yeah, so uh, awesome episode is out there. And we do have one in the can where we uh, brought D. Brad back again because we want to try to repeat that success. No, um, uh, we we have a random episode where we just talk and draw whatever. So as a little tease, I was working on some Mario professions. So I have a big boy Mario that Ooh, I was working I like on. It. If you're only hearing this, uh, you have to jump over to YouTube to get that quick sneak peek um because yeah that episode might not even be out before i uh this one might actually beat that one so that is cartoonist by night on youtube check it out subscribe and that is going to be it crimson cowl media has uh at the beginning of this episode and at the end is all the information but mighty con sunday december 10th a one-day convention in madison wisconsin uh myself david gloyd david gloyd the second as well as a friend, uh, Vince Wilson, who does 3D and resin printing. All of us are going to be there with uh, different forms of art, as well as some merchandise that David has uh, left over from the storefront store. But uh, his son, David Gloyd II, will be there as well and uh, making his debut at a Comic-Con as an artist. Uh, they have some free original web comics that are on crimsoncowl.com, so you got to check that out. And uh, yeah, so that's coming up December 10th. Uh, that's a Sunday in Madison, Wisconsin. All of the information is at the beginning and at the end of this episode. Uh, if you're listening to the audio, you don't get those graphics. So go to MightyConShows.com for information and tickets. That is going to do it for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for watching. If you like the show, please give it a like, write a review, share it with a friend, all of that fun stuff. This whole time... I've been excited to be in the Hellmouth again. I've been howling it up with Vlad at a slasher girl school. I've been the Great Gazoo. <laughs> and that translated as he's been Jim, as we can hear it. <laughs> to be continued.